felt like a superhero. I felt like I could do things that other people weren't able to do. So for me, gymnastics was just special. It was something that I really felt like challenged me, but also I excelled at. Today, our guest is David Durante. He's a multiple time USA Gymnastics National Champion and was part of the 2008 Beijing Olympics team as an alternative. After retiring from competition, David helped coach his alma mater, Sanford University, to an NCAA team title in 2019 and has continued to be a part of the sport through his position on the Athlete Advisory Committee with the United States Olympic Committee, as well as his position on the USA Gymnastics Men's Technical Committee. Dave was a lead coach with the CrossFit Gymnastics L1 course from 2013 to 2015. He also wrote and developed the CrossFit Gymnastics Advanced course. Dave is a co-owner of Power Monkey Fitness and Power Monkey Camp. Today we talk about how Olympic level gymnasts train, some of David's worst injuries while competing, and the side of gymnastics people don't see. Enjoy. What's up everyone, it's Edward from Bar Stars, and this video is brought to you by Manscaped, the first brand dedicated to under the waist hygiene and grooming. Yo, it's to shave your boss. Manscaped created the world's first all-in-one manscaping kit that makes manscaping safe and easy. Introducing the Perfect Package 3.0 kit, which includes everything you need to take your grooming routine to the next level. I'm excited to be one of the first to receive the new lawnmower 3.0 waterproof body trimmer. My favorite electric trimmer. The thing is awesome and it comes with a ton of great features. Powerful 7,000 RPM motor with quiet stroke technology. Premium 600 mAh lithium battery, extended up to 90 minutes of battery life. Intelligently designed rapid charging dock powered by USB, which means it's cordless and waterproof, which is perfect for shaving in the shower. New compact anti-tug adjustable trimmer guards, built-in LED light that illuminates grooming areas for closer, more precise trimming. When you purchase the Perfect Package 3.0 online at manscaped.com, you get the biggest bang for your buck. Get 20% off using our code plus free shipping when you purchase the Perfect Package 3.0. Using our promo code, please don't forget. Thank you guys for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. Peace. What's up, David? How's everything? Good to be here, man. Thanks for having me. All right, so uh, let's get started. Uh, how did you get started into uh, gymnastics? Sorry. Uh, all good. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey, uh, not that far away from the city, and uh, started gymnastics when I was six years old. Uh, I did a ton of sports growing up, baseball, basketball. I wrestled for a long time, a whole family of soccer players. And uh, I was just fortunate enough to have a really strong men's gymnastics program that was just a couple blocks away from my house. And I was jumping around furniture in my house, and my mom didn't want me breaking her couches, so she thought it was a better place for me to put me in the gym, and it kind of just grew from there. So when you said you do a, a, did a bunch of different sports, you did it alongside gymnastics? Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I tried to do as many sports as possible. One, because I enjoyed playing them and I really enjoyed uh, being around other kids. Uh, but I think there's a tendency for people to focus on one sport so early on that it, it doesn't really allow them to develop a lot of the tools that they need later on athletically that I think will allow them to kind of become better at whatever they decide to focus on. So for me, wrestling and playing basketball, and it gave me some tools that I eventually applied to the gymnastics world later on. I, I played soccer all the way through my freshman year of high school as well. And then finally my uh, gymnastics coach was like, okay, if we want to kind of turn this into potential college scholarship and something more, we need to focus. But most of, that, most of the time it doesn't happen. Most of the time those kids are choosing gymnastics a little bit early on and focusing completely on it. I was a little bit more about trying to try other sports as well. Yeah, gym, gymnastics training is very time consuming from, yeah. what, from what I hear. Yeah, absolutely. I had a very hectic childhood. <laughs> I mean, I would, uh, especially later on towards the end of my high school career, I was waking up early in the morning. My coach had given me the key to the gym. I would go into the gym by myself prior to school. I would do my strength training. Then I would go to school, then come back and go right to practice. I would train until, um, you know, late at night, come home, do my homework, eat and rinse and repeat for the next day. So, I mean, it doesn't give you much time to do other things, you know. You have to kind of really want it. No one's going to push you into it and it and make it stick. It's the kind of thing that you really, as a kid, have to love, have to enjoy waking up and really want to go and do it every day. So, I was fortunate that I just loved gymnastics. I really enjoyed the fact that it was a challenge in the way that most sports didn't, most other sports didn't give me. I knew that I, I felt like a superhero. I felt like I could do things that other people weren't able to do. So for me, gymnastics was just special. It was something that I really felt like challenged me, but also I excelled at. What time were you coming into the gym that you said you got the keys early? Uh, I would go in at six in the morning. I would go in six in the morning and lights off just by myself. Uh, I love Rocky growing up. So I always felt like Rocky, like training up in the, you know, in the mountains for 
competing against Drago and doing my own thing. Mm -hmm. I felt like if I wanted to, I wasn't the most talented kid in the world. Uh, in fact, I was, I wouldn't say that my talent was n anywhere near the guys that I was competing against. So I knew that my training needed to exceed what my competitors were doing. So I was like, okay, what are they doing? Are they doing three hours in the gym? I'm going to do more. I got to do more. I got to be able to make up for what I lack in talent. And so coming in the morning was my way of putting in a little bit extra time, working on areas that I needed to, where my weaknesses were, uh, in ways that I wasn't able to do it when I got the training in the afternoon. So for me, it was just, you know, uh, a way for me to focus on weaknesses, but also show that I was willing to make sacrifices that other people weren't, weren't willing to make at that age. What do you describe as uh, what you were in that talented eyes? I mean, it wasn't even close uh, to some of the kids that I was competing against in terms of pure talent. Like the, the stuff that other at your, guys... At your high school gym? Not So So the way gymnastics works uh, is high school programs don't really have gymnastics. You compete as a club. You, you go to a club gym and you compete for that particular team. Um, so it doesn't really happen. You don't really compete for your high school. There are only like two schools. New York is one of them that still have high school gymnastics, but it's very rare. I think New York and Illinois are the only still schools in the uh, country states in the country that have men's gymnastics programs in high school. So I'm comparing myself more to the national scene and what, uh, cause in my club growing up, you know, I worked my way up to being one of the top guys at my club at Surgeon Elite, which is one of the top gyms in New Jersey. And, uh, so when I say talent level, uh, at that late stage of my high school career, I'm comparing myself to the top guys around the country. Yeah. And you felt like uh, your extra work was able to help bridge that gap or surpass it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it made a huge difference in terms of uh, making up for what I lacked in talent. But to me, it was more of a mental challenge. It was able to tell me that I was able to do the things that other people weren't willing to do to achieve high level success. You have to do more. You have to be willing to do things that are not easy. And I think that's sometimes um, a missing link for a lot of people. You know, anything, anybody can do things on the days when they're easy. You know, when, when you have a good day, when your body doesn't hurt, when you feel great going into the gym. Those are the easy days, you know. Anybody can, you know, put a new skill together, do something, hit their routine on those days. What really matters and what really separates good athletes from great athletes, in my mind at least, is what happens on the days that you don't want to be in the gym. Or when your body hurts, when you got something else going on outside of your life that kind of take precedent over what you're trying to achieve in the gym. And on those days, if you can get something accomplished, even if it's something just tiny, something minuscule, some just really, really small uh, incremental positive change, those over time snowball into something bigger and bigger. And over time, those turn into significant gains. So for me, that, that mentality of I'm willing to make a sacrifice now because I know over time that's going to accumulate into something that other athletes aren't willing to do. And for me, that was what my whole career was all about, just making small incremental gains over time to catch up to those guys that were better than me. I mean, it was a very similar story from when I hear Kobe talk about his career. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, he felt like he wasn't naturally talented, so he had to put in the extra work. It's hard to see that, though, right? I mean, if you look at Kobe, you look at some of these guys that have that same similar mentality, you only see the end result, right? You see five championships, you see all those MVPs, and you think... Of course he was talented, of course. What you don't see is what happened behind the scenes. Uh, it's funny, like I have my own, my own little um, anecdotal story of Kobe. When I was at, in the Beijing Olympics, I got to train with the basketball team. And uh, I got to work out with them one day uh, in the 24-hour fitness that the U.S. had set up for us to, to go and work out. And I remember going in the, I was riding the bike and the whole team came in. And they were awesome. They were like, coolest guys like I got to work out with them and show them some gymnastics movements and there were two guys that weren't with the rest of the team LeBron and Kobe LeBron and Kobe had their own personal trainers and they were off doing their own thing killing it like just working at a level like you wouldn't believe and it really like spoke to me it was like the whole team is here but these guys are putting in more work these guys are doing something different than everybody else to make sure they're sharp to make sure that no matter what everyone else thinks about them, they're putting in more time, more effort. Even though they're the best, they got there for a reason. And it really like, it resonated with me. I was like, those guys are there for a reason. And it was because of that work. It was really amazing to see. They're special, special guys. That's crazy because it's already at the highest level because it's the Olympics and they still are like... Still, still there, man, doing like... It, there's a reason why those guys are as the superstars that they are. And it's not just because of talent. It's this merging of talent and work ethic. And if you, if you can kind of like ball that all up into something where they're at their highest level, you get people that are generational talents. Uh, a Kobe, a LeBron, a Muhammad Ali, uh, somebody that resonates with the sport 
and be on the sport and last for generations and not just within that, you know, that person's lifetime as an athlete. Yeah. So very, very special athletes like that. Can you take us through a regular day of training for uh, when you're training for the Olympics? Sure. So um, I was living at the Olympic Training Center uh, in Colorado Springs. I lived there for four and a half years. And it's kind of like a college for athletes. So you have a bunch of different sports all training for their own individual specialty. My, my day, I lived on campus. So I would wake up uh, normally 8 o'clock every morning. I'd go down and get breakfast, which is, you know, a couple steps down from where my, my, my bedroom was. I'd get breakfast, then I'd go straight to the doctors, and I would have my therapists and, and PTs and trainers get me prepped for that first day's workout. Um, I'd go into the gym for two how, and a half. How would they get you prepped? So I would do, you know, like um, get some manual therapy. I would get uh, heating pads, cooling pads, whatever I needed to really just have them ba basically assess me from the previous day to make sure I had everything ready to go for yeah. that workout. And this was every day? Every day. Every day, yeah. So they were kind of like check me out. Okay, we're ready to go. Get me ready to go. Go into the gym. We normally do about two to three, two and a half to three hours of training in the morning. Then we break for lunch. Uh, during lunch, we'd eat and I'd always go take a nap. I'd take about an hour nap and then go back uh, to see the doctors again for the afternoon training session. We do another two and a half to three hours, sometimes longer in the afternoon, sometimes a little longer than three hours, sometimes four hours. And then uh, back for recovery. Uh, recovery would be steam, sauna, massages, uh, maybe some yoga, hot, cold plunges, some, some of that um, uh, different types of therapy. And then from there, we have dinner, go to bed, and rinse and repeat. Same thing. Like uh, It's a very intense type of training. And uh, you know, being at the training center, you have everything available to you. You have sports psychologists, you have sports science department, you have uh, you know your your doctors and PTs. Everyone's there to kind of like make sure that you have what you need. Can you walk us through the training session very specifically? It, it depends on what's going on, where you are within your your training season. So you know there are kind of a periodization that goes along with within your training cycle. Uh, so it really depends on what you're trying to peak for. So as an example, if we were um, about a month out from competition, that would look very different than if we were six months out from our big competition. So like uh, a month out, what we would normally be trying to refine routines. You're not working on new skills. You're not doing a lot of volume. Uh, a month out from the competition is about refining and making sure that you're not beating up your body too much and just working on precision. So the numbers would be severely reduced. You'd be focusing more on making sure that every time, you know, in gymnastics, you raise your hand to present to the judge and it signifies that you're ready to go for your routine. So we'd raise our hand, you know, we try to put ourselves in that competitive setting as much as possible and try to make sure that every turn that we took was with purpose and with intention. So we tried more to make use, the practice sessions as you get closer to competition also shorten. So we'd probably be in, you know, maybe two hours in the morning and not three and a half and two hours at night. So they'd shorten quite a bit. And you would try to make sure that your mental training was increased and your physical training was decreased. So it really just depends on where you are within the training cycle and how that changes according to you know what your your peak point is and really what your target goal is in terms of where that competition is. Did you have separate segments for strength training and just practicing? Absolutely. So um, strength training normally uh, we we do specific strength training three to four days a week. Uh, the way our training schedule within the week looked, we did. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday were hard days. Thursday was a light day. Friday was a very hard day. Saturday was a moderate day. And then Sundays we had off. All right. So within that, that training structure, um, our strength days were Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. Saturdays were always more kind of conditioning as opposed to pure strength. But Monday, Wednesday, Friday were really our heavy duty strength days where we would work on positional work, something on rings, rings and parallel bars, but ring, rings is where we kind of showcase our strength movements. Things like crosses and Maltese's and planches and inverted crosses and whatever else. So we would focus completely on our strength-based training on those three days, three, three days, and we would primarily do it at the end of practice. Yep. So you would practice first and then kind of like burn out with the yep. strength training. Yeah, we did it specifically so that um, we would try exactly to burn out and and try to work towards fatigue and beyond fatigue as much as possible. Now, what's important to note there is that. You know, some people might look at strength training and want to do it prior when you're fresh to kind of see what you're capable of doing at its maximum point. And there is value there. And we would do those sessions as well to kind of see, you know, if we could give ourselves enough recovery and do things fresh, what our positions would look like. But also we have to factor in what's happening in the rest of the training session. So you don't want to fatigue your, yourself out too much 
for what's needed with your actual training sessions, routines and half routines or whatever it might be. If you're fatigued from your strength, if you're trying to do a full routine, that fatigue will affect your ability to perfect those routines. So we were always very conscious to make sure that the strength sessions were done after so that we didn't have to do anything after that might be technically challenging, that might affect our ability to perform in those routines, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. Did you guys have like a, a split routine where it's like upper, lower, or like you say for a traditional bodybuilder, bro split, would be like biceps would be today, triceps would be that. Or is it just full body every time you train? Well, what's really interesting is that one, we focus a ton on core strength. Like gymnastics training is predominantly making sure we understand core to extremity. So we build a ton of core strength into everyday training. So not just your ab muscles either, not just what you can see in the mirror. Yes, your abs and your hip flexors, but oblique work, rotational and lateral work, posterior chain, that was a part of our strength training every day. So core strength was kind of our baseline. Now upper body, is where a majority of gymnastics strength is, is used. So, and it's anterior uh, strength, upper body strength too. It's anterior delt, it's your biceps, your pec, it's a lot of the front part of that shoulder. Um, so what we have a tendency to do is overdevelop the front part of the shoulder. And it's actually why, you know, uh, there's such a high prevalence of shoulder injuries in the gymnastics world too. We would do a lot of balancing out too, just to kind of create more prevention and more be more preventative when it comes to uh, shoulder health. But we, don't do enough, and this is one of the things I learned later in my career once I started getting into more CrossFit and working more with weightlifters and things like that, was creating a balance. You're talking about upper body and lower half you know, being equal. I don't really take my pants off and to wear shorts too often because my, my legs are like chicken legs. And it's because in the gymnastics world, there's not much value there. You know, We do so much rebounding, and the strength that we use in the gymnastics world has to do more with getting power from the surfaces that we're on rather than generating power on our own. So if you go to a gymnastics training session, there's going to be very little uh, strength training in the lower lower half. But I, th I feel like this is a missing link. I feel like this is one of the things that I would have benefited more from. And it's one of the reasons, uh, you know, we mentioned off the air, I had some injuries in the gymnastics world. And I think I would have benefited from more lower body strength, working on quad strength, working on bottom squats, working on things that would have helped build the surrounding tissues around my knees and ankles and hips to help create a more secure base and we don't really do that very much in gymnastics. So it's one of the things that you'll notice most gymnasts miss out on. It's one of the things I'm encouraging gymnasts to incorporate more into their training now. And you're starting to see it a little bit more as the, as the sport evolves. Do you think having big bulky legs might... Uh, I think it's a detriment. It? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a detriment because it's all about balance. You know, it's about uh, the positions that we're trying to be good on and things like rings. You know, it's about trying to make sure that we can, you know, counterbalance certain positions like a cross or like a Maltese or a planche. And so having a really bulky lower half just makes things more challenging. You know, it's added weight at the end of that lever that, you know, can be more detrimental than is necessary for what we're using. So it's very strength specific, but I think we can train in a way that allows that lower half to become not as susceptible to injury and more of a, a position of strength and not necessarily build bulk. That makes sense. So you can still get the benefits of creating security and control, but not necessarily building bulk. Got it. Yep. And how long did you compete for? I competed uh, until I was almost 29. So I was kind of the old man on the team. I actually peaked much later in a career than most, most gymnasts, men's gymnasts specifically. I'd say most male gymnasts normally peak around mid-20s, and I peaked more towards late 20s, which is rare. So, uh, you know, I did the sport from when I was six until I was 29, essentially. So good portion of my life. Can you tell us about some of your injuries? Sure. Uh, you know, I consider myself pretty lucky uh, compared to a lot of people, but I'll rattle off some things here and you're going to hear a pretty long list. But um, the major ones, I've blown out my knees three times, ACL, MCL, meniscus, two on my left, one on my right. Uh, I've subluxed my left shoulder six or seven times. I've broken uh, countless bones, probably upwards of 20 to 30 different bones, uh, torn ligaments, torn my UCL on my right elbow. Uh, I've torn all the fascia on my feet, which was by far the most painful injury I've ever had in my life. Uh, how, how did you do that one? That one's very vivid in my mind. Uh, I was doing a movement on high bar where you release the bar. So you're swinging around the bar and doing giants, which is like generating momentum. And then you release the bar and you do two flips over the bar with a full twist called a Coleman. And then you catch the bar again. And I caught the bar with my left hand, but I missed with my right and I caught underneath my grip. And when I swung underneath the bar, this hand came off and I turned and peeled off of the bar. 
And I was in a pit at the training center, so there's like foam everywhere and there's mats surrounding, so it's a pretty safe environment. But there was a section of the pit that was exposed to concrete and it was only like a foot, foot wide. And for whatever reason, that's exactly where I hit with both feet impacting the corner of that concrete. And my fascia, I just completely destroyed the fascia at the bottom of my feet. And it was the most searing, like incredibly painful thing. It was like a white lightning bolt hit my body. And uh, it was awful. They thought I broke both of my heels. So I was um, in a wheelchair for a couple of weeks um, recovering from that. Uh, I didn't have feeling at the bottom of my feet for like a couple of years. And finally it started to come back again. But that was awful. That was a really brutal one. Wow. Yeah, it was a painful. It sounds painful. <laughs> Uh, the, are these injuries that you still feel to this day? Uh, for the most part, I have to say that the incorporation uh, of the training that I'm doing now with CrossFit and continuing to do a lot of the gymnastic stuff, static holds and stuff like that, I've been able to get to a point where I'm as healthy as I've ever been. Uh, my knees have not given me an issue in a really long time. And that's the thing that I was always concerned with, you know, three blown out knees. I've had three reconstructions. I always thought that, you know, as I got older, that my knees would continue to give me problem. But have full range. There's very little pain, if any. You know, maybe if I'm doing a lot high volume, uh, lower half workout, I'll start to feel a little irritation here and there. But uh, for the most part, I'm in I'm in pretty healthy shape considering my age and the things that I've gone through in my career. What advice would you give yourself if you're able to go back in time before the first injury? Well, one, the first injury was just stupid, <laughs> and uh, I blew my first knee out uh, my first day in college. I flew from New Jersey all the way out to California. I was part of the Stanford team. I was so excited to go compete for Stanford. I went in the gym. My first turn, my first day, I fell and I blew my knee out. And it was like just a shitty way to start out my college career. You know, I was so excited to go compete and contribute to the team. And that basically first year was um, a wash. Like I ended up, I competed once or twice, but uh, it was a really just terrible way to start out my college career. So I think going back, I would tell myself to spend more time on leg strength. I would tell myself to make sure that you spend more time on that lower half to help balance out what you're going to be doing in the upper half. Got it. What are some rules in gymnastics that are not familiar to people that are just watching? A rule book, book is like a thousand pages thick. It's the difficult part of explaining is that they're changing the rules so often and making little tweaks that even for coaches and judges and athletes, it's hard to keep up with all the changes. But there are a few that I think the everyday viewer would benefit from understanding. One, 10.0 is not a good score anymore. So 10.0 is, is no longer the top score in our sport. And that changed uh, in the early 2000s. It went from 10.0 being a perfect score to what we call an open-ended scoring system. So in our, our sport, we have two judging panels. We have a difficulty panel and an execution panel. So the D panel and the E panel. And they judge different things. The difficulty panel judging is looking for 10 skills that you have to do within your routine. So what you're trying to do is do skills that are on a, a letter scale from difficulty where A level skill is our most basic and now I level skill is our most difficult. And you're trying to do as many most difficult skills as you possibly can within that 10 to get your difficulty up really high. And then the execution starts at a 10.0 and then the judges deduct according to you know how well you do the routine. And then those two scores are combined together to get your final score. So depending on the event, a score can, you know, a 13, five, a 14, a 15, a 16, those are all the scores that you're gonna be looking at if you're, you know, watching the Olympics come this summer. How do they do the math? Do they add them or? They add them average? together, they add them together. So they'll add the difficulty score to the, um, the average, cause there's about, there's like four judges on the, the execution side and there's four judges on the difficulty side and they'll average them and average them and then combine them together. So it's, it's a very complicated process to kind of get your average overall total score. When you were training and, comp and competing, were you very uh, mindful of your weight? Uh, I was later in my career. And again, this is something that I wish I would have done earlier. It's funny. Um, I was not super conscious of nutrition. You know, this is 20 years ago in a lot of cases when I was like coming up and, and you know, nutrition wasn't as important or wasn't as emphasized as it is today in terms of the importance when you're training. And I remember being at a competition and my coach at the time, he's very outspoken, not very subtle when it comes to, you know, uh, letting his thoughts be known. And uh, we were at a competition and just out for lunch and I ordered a burger and he's like, what the hell are you eating? You're eating that before we go out in the competition tomorrow? Like, like, what are you thinking? And I wasn't thinking like, I was just like, and I got offended. I was like, like, lay off, like, 
give me a break. Like, let me eat what I want. But he was completely right. He was completely right in terms of what I put in my body had a major impact in terms of my output. And, you know, my metabolism is not great. Like I'm the kind of person that puts on weight really quickly and easily. And I was kind of the fat guy on the team always. And so I was always trying to figure out ways to uh, get my weight under control. And I competed best at around 148 pounds. Um, anything, I tried competing at 145 a couple of times and it was it was too light for me. Like I felt like I, I didn't uh, perform optimally at that weight. So for me, I tried to stick around 148. But that burger completely changed the way that I approached training in terms of diet. And um, I mean, I've slowly changed that even more over the course of the last 10 years or so. I don't eat meat anymore. Uh, very little dairy, no dairy. You know, there's certain things that I've kind of changed my my lifestyle to work around as I got older and more kind of aware to what works well for me. But uh, early on in my career, I ate like shit and it definitely affected the way that I trained. Do you eat fish? I do, I do eat fish, yeah. So I consider myself kind of pes- pescatarian, but I don't eat dairy. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of the same way. Yeah, yeah. So what made you stop eating meat? Um, I had really high cholesterol and it was just kind of testing some things out. Uh, some of it's genetic. My dad had really high cholesterol as well. And uh, the doctor was considering putting me on medication. And I was like, I'm definitely not going on medication. Um, and so I went vegan for a few months just to kind of see whether or not it would ha- have any effect. And I lowered my cholesterol like 70 points in, wow. in two months. And, you know, for me, that was just an indicator that, you know, how much diet can have an effect in terms of these markers that uh, doctors are kind of looking for in terms of overall health. And um, so I saw that it was, had a benefit for me, G- was able to kind of work my way away from potentially using medication as a, as a, a remedy there. And my, my wife is also vegetarian. So in the household, it was just easier for us to be able to kind of match up our diets. Um, I got her to eventually incorporate some more fish into her diet. I kept the meat out, kept the dairy out and reincorporated the fish over time. And that's kind of where we ended up. And me and my wife are on the same diet now. Awesome. Yeah. What are some struggles that people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't know that gymnasts go through? Uh, I think the mental side is way underestimated. Um, it's a real, real struggle. And, um, the mental side of the sport is as important, if not more important than the physical side. And I think, you know, it can be kind of a lonely sport. A lot of times it's an individual sport and you kind of get caught in this, your own little world. And what I always appreciated that most people probably don't recognize is that to me, gymnastics can be just as much about individual sport as it is about a team sport. That's why I love competing for college. That's why I love competing for Team USA. I always felt like even though you were out there raising your hand, it was only you, you were competing for those other five guys or you competing for those other guys that were on your team with you. And so competing for Team USA and for Stanford and for a college team, it gave me the ability to kind of feel like I was doing it more than just for myself. And it, it allowed me to work and commiserate with other people that were going through something similar and be able to share the experience. Because like I said, it can be really lonely and having a team gives you the ability to say, you know what, like this training is, you know, super difficult or it's, you know, what do you, what's going through your head when we're going out on the competition floor? How do you get through those mental barriers or, you know, competing in front of 20,000 people and like feeling like the whole world is about to collapse on you. And uh, before the Athens Olympic Games in 2004, I was still training at Stanford and I kind of got into this. I wasn't on the team anymore. I wasn't in college anymore. I was kind of assistant coach and I was just training. And I put myself in this world where I shut everybody else out. I, I shut my friends out, shut my coaches out, my family, and I was just training. And I felt like, you know, this is what I needed to do to be my best. Like, I just tunnel, tunnel focus, targeted training, just get in the gym, get your shit done and go home. And it was the biggest downturn in my career I've ever had. Uh, it totally wore me down. I had a mental breakdown, essentially. Like, I would come in the gym and I would just start crying. And I would just like, my coach like, what's wrong with you? Like, why are you crying right now? I'd be like, I just can't do this. It was like totally mentally draining. And it was because I, I let the sport kind of consume me. And um, it, it totally affected the way that I trained. It affected every relationship that I had. And I knew I was kind of an asshole at that time in my life. I was just like someone that shut everybody else out. And I think that can happen to a lot of athletes that are in an individual sport not able to feel like they have someone there to connect with and and share the experience on how how difficult it can be to really try to feel like you're achieving, you know, world-class status within a particular sport. 
and uh, not feeling like you have someone to kind of like share that experience with. So uh, when I moved to the Olympic Training Center, I kind of was like, okay, I'm starting fresh. And I opened myself up to the people I was training up with and my new coaches a lot more. And it helped me kind of find balance within my training. So that mental side, I think for most athletes can sometimes be overlooked, but it's one of those things you have to conquer as much as you're conquering a specific skill. Yeah, I could agree with that. Fully. Yeah. I think, uh, especially because how difficult the skills are oh, and yeah. how much time it takes to go into it. Yeah, and you, you, can, you feel like everything's a distraction. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing with gymnastic skills too, the unfortunate part is like you can maybe it's similar with your world. You can learn a skill, but then you can lose it. You can lose it and be like, shit, like I had it yesterday. Why don't I have it today? And it kind of like compounds like, oh my God, like I'm supposed to be putting this in a routine. I got a competition coming up. And there's like the wheel starts spinning like, okay, the mental side is starting to get a hold of me. And, you know, you work with psychologists and you figure out like little mental training tools to be able to kind of get yourself back to a good spot. But it's not easy, man. And the mental side is, I think, things sometimes just way overlooked. People just see the physical, physical component and say like, shit, this stuff is hard. But the mental side is just as challenging. Yeah. That always sucks when you're like, you get a front lever and then you start training something else. It's like, shit, the front lever's gone. Now. Right, right. And it's like, there's only so much time in a day. <laughs> exactly, you know? exactly. You got to prioritize, right? Uh, do you, as a gymnast, were you training with like weight training at any were there any weight training exercises part of your regular routine as a dumbbells. competing gymnast? Ton of dumbbells. Like dumbbell training in the gymnastics world is used, utilized regularly. Uh, barbell work, not so much. We started working with uh, the, the strength conditioning coach at the Olympic Training Center on some barbell movements for a portion of my training. And I actually started to see a benefit. I started to do some you know, Olympic lifts, some, some squats, some deadlifts, uh, even some cleans and things like that. Uh, not too in-depth. Uh, but just some, just to, to build some structure around the lower half of the body. And I started to see some benefit in terms of my landing and my security in terms of uh, what I was doing on floor and vault, the two leg events in the gymnastics world. But uh, my coaches kind of shied away from doing it on a regular basis. There was some upper body training in there too, and they didn't want us to do anything other than what we were already doing in the gym. So um, it's very rare to see gymnasts incorporate uh, barbell work into their training. But I'd say that dumbbell training is a huge component of the gymnastics training world. You see that quite a bit. What's some of the stuff you could do with the dumbbells? Tons of stuff. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, uh, there are two movements that are really common in the gymnastics world on rings. A Maltese cross. Uh, I don't know if you guys might know what that is. Yeah, it's familiar. basically holding yourself out completely horizontal. So similarly to a planche, but instead of your shoulders being above the rings, they're in line with the rings. So your body is completely flat, shoulders, hands, hips, and feet all in one line. So one of the moves that we do with dumbbells to kind of build that specific strength, we call them Maltese raises, laying uh, supinated kind of on your back on like a pommel horse or on a raised service on a bench with dumbbells in your hands, uh, letting them drop below your hips and then pulling them up to basically a planche position. Just working back and forth. What that does is, yes, it builds a specific uh, muscle groups that are used in something like a Maltese, the biceps, the front part of the shoulder, as well as the pec but it works a ton on getting elbow connective tissue strength in place, as well as the connective tissue strength of the shoulder. It's one of the missing links. So gymnastic strength is all about straight arm strength, right? A lot of it is, it's very different than bent arm strength. So we, the dumbbell work that we do has a lot of uh, application towards building connective tissue strength so that we can actually hold those positions with that ar arm fully extended. Same overhead, an inverted cross when you're upside down in, an, in a handstand, and then lowering uh, on the rings into an inverted cross. We do the same thing with the dumbbells, do a lot of invert raises, which applies that same kind of stress to the connective tissue to help build it for what you're going to eventually use it for. Would well, you guys go like really heavy on the weight, I imagine? Eventually, we start building to pretty heavy weights. Um, we had drop sets that we'd use pretty often. So uh, one common um, rep scheme that we would use, we do three sets of 10 reps with like a 55 pound dumbbell in each hand, 10 reps, and then a 10th rep, hold for 10 seconds, then drop the 55, pick up 45s, do the same thing with 45s. 10 reps, 10 second hold, drop those and do the same thing with 35s. So it'll be three sets of 10 reps with three different weights within each round. So the 55, you know, you're doing 110 pounds of weight. Most gymnasts are around, you know, 120 to 150 pounds. So you're doing a ton of weight um, with those dumbbells with 10 reps with that hold. It's a really, really challenging exercise. If anybody does it, I recommend people doing them, but always starting at a really, really light weight because most people can probably do more weight from a musculature standpoint but don't have the connective tissue to be able to withstand that weight. So what you're doing with the light weight is actually building connective tissue strength first and then building the weight on top of that, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yep. How common is it for a gymnast to be able to hold a, a planche? 
Uh, so there are plant variations, right? Uh, straddle planch is um, on rings is a movement that I'd say is fairly common. Uh, you'll see kids 12, 13 years old, you putting them in routines. Uh, and so that's a movement that you, you'll see a lot of early teens be able to do. Uh, at the higher level, the collegiate level, basically everyone should be able to do a straddle planche on rings, not even on floor. On floor, you know, you see it. You don't see too many people doing because it doesn't have a lot of value. So you're always trying to do things that have maximum value in terms of its application to a routine. But on rings, you start to see it much more often now. Straight leg planche is much harder. Straight leg planche actually is a C-level movement. So I mentioned very briefly categorizing skills in the gymnastics world from an A being most basic all the way up to I level skills being most challenging. And a straight leg planche is a C level movement. So on that kind of continuum of skills, a straight leg planche is still not considered super challenging, but there are variations to getting to it. So you can kind of press into it or swing into it and it increases the value to something like a D. So um, the straight leg planche is much more difficult and you don't see many people, you start seeing that more in like ring specialists and you know, on the collegiate level, like guys that are really good on rings or guys that, you know, only specialize in that particular event. The guys at the world-class level, the guys that are going to be, you know, vying for an Olympic final spot or a medal, a straddle planche is very, or a legs together planche is super easy for them. So it kind of like slowly starts to get more and more challenging. And you start to see just these pockets of guys that are able to do those movements as they become more challenging. Oh, what grade letter is a front lever? Um, it's an A. Wow. It's an A. And a back lever? Same A. They're, those are both A-level movements. Um, almost no gymnast at a higher level will ever do them in competition because they're not worth it. So what you normally see is a front lever and a back lever done by kids learning because they have application to things like planches and things like Victorians and to higher level movements later down the road. But they're kind of starter skills for most people in the gymnastics world. Yeah. How long do all these positions held when done in gymnastics? Yeah, so for full credit, uh, you have to hold the skill for two seconds. Now... A judge's two seconds is different than when you're in the movement. The judge counts very slowly. So what we say is that you always think about counting three seconds in your head. It's a one, one thousand, two, one thousand. That's how long you have to hold it to get full credit. Now, um, it will any anything less than that, you'll get deducted. So if you're slightly under that, there'll be a deduction according to you know how long you 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 hold it or don't hold it. Um, if you move, if you're constantly moving through the movement. Uh, you get no value. You don't get the skill at all. So even if you're kind of like on an iron cross and like slowly moving, there's no value. You don't get it at all unless you actually show a pause. Wow. So, so if you budge a little bit. Nothing. You don't get it. Yeah. And how about if you hold it for extra time? It's if you you see this a lot with guys at the Olympic level too, you're showing off. You're showing that the movement is easy for you. And there's a couple other variations that athletes will do now, which is actually really cool. And if you're going to watch the Olympics this summer, I highly recommend you keep an eye out for this. So you know what a false grip is? Yeah. So false grip is basically shortening the lever from that wrist. So the ring or the bar doesn't sit in the palm of the hand anymore. It sits more at the crease of the wrist. So it shortens the lever to give yourself a mechanical advantage. So in the gymnastics world, you'll see this a lot. Guys doing Maltese's and crosses with a, a false grip. And in our code of points, it's actually a deduction. You can't do that. And if, you, if the judge sees a false grip in those positions, it's a deduction. You know, they take off points. Uh, what you're starting to see the top guys in the world now do is instead of being arm fully extended and false grip in places, they're opening up the palm of their hand and fingers completely flat in all these positions to show that they don't have a false grip. So it's a way not only it looks badass, it actually looks really, really cool yeah, sounds sick. to hold that hand completely at, out and the ring really just sitting flat. But it also shows the judges that there's no false grip. So it's one of the ways for the the elite of the elite when it comes to rings to be able to separate themselves from maybe another guy that is doing with a false grip. So it's something to look out for when you're watching somebody on rings. Are they doing a false grip? Are their hands out flat? That'll tell you who's the higher level competitor. You know, it's a really good indicator as to who's a little bit of higher level competitor. So the most difficult moves are letter I. There's only one. What There's only that? one I level movement and it's new to our code of points. It was just added recently. Um, it was... Originally attempted by a German gymnast a couple of years ago, right before the 2016 Olympic Games. And uh, he was able to complete it in, in uh, training. And then he went to compete it at the Olympic Games. Now, in the gymnastics world, if you complete a skill, new skill successfully at either World Championships or in Olympic Games, you get the skill named after you. So he competed at the 2016 Olympics, but he missed it. And the skill is 
what I, similar to what I was telling you about what I hurt my, my feet on, you let go of the bar on high bar, you release, and you do two flips over the bar, but instead of doing it tucked with one twist, you do it with straight body, so like a laid out position with two twists. So it's an insane skill, just absolutely crazy. It's mind boggling what they're able to do. So he releases two flips over the bar with a straight body with two twists and then catches the bar again. The German gymnast missed it at the Olympic Games in 2016. And the following year at the 2017 World Championships, a Japanese gymnast completed it successfully. So it's named after the Japanese gymnast, not oh. the German gymnast. But that happens every so often. But the skill is absolutely amazing. There's only really a handful of guys in the world that can do that movement. That's a high bar skill. It's a high bar skill, yeah. What's yeah. the most difficult ring skill? So um, there are a couple. Um, Victorian is one of them. And there's only a handful of guys in the world that have ever done a Victorian. And a Victorian is basically the opposite of a Maltese. So instead of your body facing the ground prone, you're supinated again. Your body's facing up towards the, the ring tower or the ceiling. And you're pressing down on the rings. So it's a lot more heavily activated. The lats, your tricep, your rear delt, as opposed to all being anterior related. So you're holding your body out completely flat with your stomach facing up. That one is incredibly challenging. Again, only a few guys in the world have ever done it. And even smaller percentage have done it well. There's only one or two guys that have actually done it to the point where it's completely flat. There are some other movements. Uh, there's a new one that actually, I don't think it's actually been done in competition yet, but I saw it posted and I actually uh, commented it on my Instagram not that long ago. Uh, doing uh, an uh, L cross, so you know iron cross, then you do it with an L sit. So your legs are out horizontal. Then recently, within the past decade or so, gymnasts started doing a V sit cross. So bring the legs vertical within an iron cross. And I just saw a Japanese gymnast do a mana cross. So you went from legs vertical to legs horizontal to now legs vertical again in the L sit and now turning completely over while still being in an iron cross. It's crazy. It's one of those things that like, even when I was competing a decade ago, I never thought anyone would ever have the ability to do something like that. And the sport is constantly evolving, constantly getting more challenging. But that skill, when I saw it, I was like, oh my God, this is bonkers. It's like another world. So from a strength perspective, the guys are just doing some crazy ass stuff. Uh, then there's swing movements as well. There's dynamic actions that are really challenging. But from a strength perspective, those are two that are just top shelf. How has your training changed since you left gymnastics? So uh, after I retired, um, had some knee surgeries and things like that. Uh, I started, I was actually moved back out to Stanford and uh, was helping to coach the team in 2009. We won a national championship that year, which is awesome. Uh, but I started kind of like wanting to figure out what I wanted to do with my training post competitive uh, world. And so I started to do my own like conditioning and things like that in the gym and over time, I got a little bit bored with what I was doing and I uh, searched online and actually found CrossFit. And CrossFit was kind of emerging at the time. It was like late 2009, 2010 time period. And so I started doing um, CrossFit workouts as a supplement to my training. And, you know, CrossFit has a lot of gymnastics components to it. And I love the fact that they were incorporating rings into training and handstands and bar work. And to me, I was like, this is awesome. This is taking a world that I know and, and creating a new spin on it. So uh, I kind of jumped with two feet into the CrossFit world. And I've used that as kind of my main training uh, for the past decade. And I still do a considerable amount of gymnastics specific training, uh, but only in certain areas that I know can sustain. So I've jumped much more into the handstand world. So I've done a lot more handstand training. And I still do some static holes, things like planches and some other things. But those are more just to kind of see if I can maintain them. I'm trying to, you know, I have certain goals within the handstand world. But for the rest of the stuff, it's just about maintaining my strength in the gymnastics side. Awesome. Uh, tell us about Power Monkey Fitness. Yeah, that's my that's my company. I have a co-owner. Uh, his name's Shane Garrity. He's another New Yorker. He was a gymnast uh, and now a stunt performer. He does a lot of stuff in you know Hollywood. Uh, me and him had a product that we thought could be really helpful for the CrossFit and bodyweight training world that uh, we came up with about a decade ago, and uh, it's uh, it's called our Ring Thing. And it's basically a dream machine. If you ever you know, went to a gymnastics gym, it's a 50-50 device where you have a harness that's attached to some rings and a pulley. And as you pull down on the rings, it lifts your body up at 50% of its body weight. So it allows you to work on very, very challenging movements with half your body weight. And so we thought this tool, if we made a really high level one, a really well-made one, that we could chop it around to you know the CrossFit world, but also to uh, you know the body weight fitness world as a tool to be able to work on movements that people weren't able to do without. And it kind of gained some momentum and we were able to find a manufacturer for it. And it was an existing company, Power Monkey Fitness. They were based out in Florida. 
they started making the product for us. And from there, we became partners. We eventually bought the company out, me and my partner, and we expanded the offerings. And we started doing a lot more events. So we host a, a fitness camp, Power Monkey Camp, two times a year, once in the fall and once in the spring. And it's a full week-long adult fitness camp in this awesome 150-acre campus that we have in Tennessee. It's a kids' gymnastics camp in the summers, and we take over with adults uh, in the fall and spring. We bring in 100 participants and another 50 coaches, guests, and staff. Uh, all of our coaches have been elite athletes in their own individual sports and that transition into coaching, but it's not just gymnastics. So it's gymnastics and weightlifting and kettlebell training and rowing and endurance training and jump rope training. And we try to take kind of a holistic approach to being a well-rounded athlete. And that's been like a big component in terms of what we offer. Uh, so our events, we do weekend clinics and things like that all around the world, working on making sure people understand proper technique. Uh, we consider ourselves kind of an education company. And uh, our mantra is that technique matters. And we want people to learn the proper foundation for how to build towards really high level movements, but to do them with longevity. We want people 10, 20, 30 years from, the, you know, from their starting point to be able to continue to get better and to understand that health and quality of life is as important as learning a particular skill. So we emphasize technique as our priority. It's one of our, you know, our... Um, most well thought out points, one of the things that we really pass on to our clients quite often. And we do it through the events that I mentioned, but we also have an online presence as well. We have an app called our, our Monkey Method app, which has all our skill specific plans, you know, uh, no matter what your starting point, if you want to learn strict pull up or strict muscle up or kipping muscle up, a bar muscle up, we have plans that go from basically a zero point all the way to more advanced. And it's a stepping stone process uh, according to the assessment that you put in. So uh, we have an app that allows for that. And then we have some online training as well as our more global gymnastics training. And so um, we're really trying to give people a well thought out uh, approach to training good technique uh, with people who are very involved with the sport at a high level. Both gymnastics and weightlifting is kind of where we start out. And we've, we're building from the coaches that we have at camp into more programs. So uh, it's pretty wide offerings, but essentially we're an education company. Awesome. And you can find that under Power Monkey Fitness. PowerMonkeyFitness.com and then PowerMonkeyCamp.com. Those are our two uh, main platforms in terms of websites. And then we started a podcast not that long ago, too. Uh, it's called Power Monkey Podcast. And it's myself uh, and my co-host. He's a two-time Olympian for the U.S. in the weightlifting world. So he was on the 2004 and 2008 U.S. Olympic teams for weightlifting. His name's Chad Vaughn. And he's a very well-known uh, athlete and coach in the CrossFit and weightlifting world. And me and him talk to guests from our athletic backgrounds and, and the world that we work in and, and basically try to get technique advice and kind of uh, some more in-depth information from those athletes and coaches and trainers and whatever it might be. So we're, we're just trying to expand the offerings in terms of how we can get education out to more people. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks, I'm definitely listening to the podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming today. I, I've had a blast. I learned a lot and I hope to see you again. Absolutely, man. I appreciate the time.